preface and dramatis personae of an old-fashioned girl by louisa may alcott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org as a preface is the only place where an author can with propriety explain a purpose or apologize for shortcomings i venture to avail myself of the privilege to make a statement for the benefit of my readers as the first part of an old-fashioned girl was written in eighteen sixty nine the demand for a sequel in beseeching little letters that made refusal impossible rendered it necessary to carry my heroine boldly forward some six or seven years into the future the domestic nature of the story makes this audacious proceeding possible while the lively fancies of my young readers will supply all deficiencies and overlook all discrepancies this explanation will i trust relieve those well-regulated minds who cannot conceive of such literary lawlessness from the bewilderment which they suffered when the same experiment was tried in a former book the old-fashioned girl is not intended as a perfect model but as a possible improvement upon the girl of the period who seems sorrowfully ignorant or ashamed of the good old fashions which make woman truly beautiful and honored and through her render home what it should be a happy place where parents and children brothers and sisters learn to love and know and help one another if the history of polly's girlish experiences suggests a hint or insinuates a lesson i shall feel that in spite of many obstacles i have not entirely neglected my duty toward the little men and women for whom it is an honor and a pleasure to write since in them i have always found my kindest patrons gentlest critics warmest friends l m a narrator read by christine layman polly milton read by hannah mary fanny shaw read by angela tom shaw read by thomas peter maud read by laura riley mr shaw read by greg giordano mrs shaw read by Kay hand grandma shaw read by beth thomas Mr. Sidney, read by Daniel Mativier. Mrs. Milton, read by The Story Girl. Miss Mills, read by T.J. Burns. Jenny Bryant, read by Leon Yao. Becky Jeffrey, read by Adelda Pinerolis. Bess, read by Esther Benzaminides. Kate Kane, read by Leon Yao. Will, read by Jonas Houston. Trix, read by Devorah Allen. Belle, Read by Esteban Simonides. Emma Davenport. Read by Adele de Pinerales. Miss Perkins. Read by The Story Girl. Alice Lovett. Read by Leanne Yao. Blanche. Read by Jasmine Selma. Grace. Read by April. Katie. Read by Twinkle. Young Lady. Read by Leanne Yao. Pale Girl. Read by the story girl little girl read by lian yao pet read by lorda the doctor read by asher grabi reader read by esterben simonides mamie read by stacy simon maid read by delta pinerolis boy read by asher grabi go gossip read by lian yao End of Dramatis Personae Chapter One of An Old Fashioned Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org an old-fashioned girl by louisa may alcott chapter one polly arrives it's time to go to the station tom 
<sighs> Come on, then. Oh, I'm not going. It's too wet. Shouldn't have a crib left if I went out such a day as this, and I want to look nice when Polly comes. You don't expect me to go and bring home a strange girl alone, do you? And Tom looked as much alarmed as if his sister had proposed to him to escort the wild woman of Australia. Of course I do. It's your place to go and get her, and if you wasn't a bear, you'd like it. Well, I call that mean. I supposed I'd got to go, but you said you'd go too. Catch me bothering about your friends another time. No, sir. And Tom rose from the sofa with an air of indignant resolution, the impressive effect of which was somewhat damaged by a tousled head and the hunched appearance of his garments generally. Now don't be cross, and I'll get Mama to let you have that horrid Ned Miller that you were so fond of come and make you a visit after Polly's gone, said Fanny, hoping to soothe his ruffled feelings. How long is she going to stay? demanded tom making his toilet by a promiscuous shake a month or two maybe she's ever so nice and i shall keep her as long as she's happy she won't stay long then if i can help it muttered tom who regarded girls as a very unnecessary portion of creation boys of fourteen are apt to think so and perhaps it is a wise arrangement for being fond of turning somersaults they have an opportunity of indulging in a good one metaphorically speaking when three or four years later they become the abject slaves of those bothering girls look here how am i going to know the creature i never saw her and she never saw me you'll have to come too fan he added pausing on his way to the door arrested by the awful idea that he might have to address several strange girls before he got the right one you'll find her easy enough she'll probably be standing round looking for us i dare say she'll know you though i'm not there because i've described you to her guess she won't then and tom gave a hasty smooth to his curly pate and a glance at the mirror feeling sure that his sister hadn't done him justice sisters never do as we fellows know too well do go along or you'll be too late and then what will polly think of me cried fanny with the impatient poke which is peculiarly aggravating to masculine dignity She'll think you care more about your frizzles than your friends, and she'll be about right, too. Feeling that he said rather a neat and cutting thing, Tom sauntered leisurely away, perfectly conscious that it was late, but bent on not being hurried while in sight, though he ran himself off his legs to make up for it afterward. If I was the president, I'd make a law to shut up all boys till they were grown, for they certainly are the most provoking toads in the world said fanny as she watched the slouchy figure of her brother strolling down the street she might have changed her mind however if she had followed him for as soon as he turned the corner his whole aspect altered his hands came out of his pockets he stopped whistling buttoned his jacket gave his cap a pull and went off at a great pace the train was just in when he reached the station panting like a racehorse and as red as a lobster with the wind and the run suppose she'll wear a topknot and a thingamabob like everyone else and however shall i know her too bad a fan to make me come alone thought tom as he stood watching the crowd stream through the depot and feeling rather daunted at the array of young ladies who passed as none of them seemed looking for any one he did not accost them but eyed each new batch with the air of a martyr that's her he said to himself as he presently caught sight of a girl in gorgeous array standing with her hands folded and a very small hat perched on the top of a very large chignon as tom pronounced it i suppose i've got to speak to her so here goes and nerving himself to the task tom slowly approached the damsel who looked as if the wind had blown her clothes into rags such a flapping of sashes scallops ruffles curls and feathers was there i say if you please is your name polly milton meekly asked tom pausing before the breezy stranger no it isn't answered the young lady with a cool stare that utterly quenched him where in thunder is she growled tom walking off in high dudgeon 
the quick tap of feet behind him made him turn in time to see a fresh-faced little girl running down the long station and looking as if she rather liked it as she smiled and waved her bag at him he stopped and waited for her saying to himself hello i wonder if that's polly up came the little girl with her hand out and a half shy half merry look in her blue eyes as she said inquiringly this is tom isn't it yes how did you know and tom got over the ordeal of handshaking without thinking of it he was so surprised oh fan told me you'd got curly hair and a funny nose and kept whistling and wore a gray cap pulled over your eyes so i knew you directly and polly nodded at him in the most friendly manner having politely refrained from calling the hair red the nose a pug and the cap old all of which facts fanny had carefully impressed upon her memory where are your trunks asked tom as he was reminded of his duty by her handing him the bag which he had not offered to take father told me not to wait for any one else i'd lose my chance of a hack so i gave my check to a man and there he is with my trunk and polly walked off after her one modest piece of baggage followed by tom who felt a trifle depressed by his own remissness in polite attentions she isn't a bit of a young lady thank goodness fan didn't tell me she was pretty don't look like city girls nor act like em neither he thought trudging in the rear and eyeing with favor the brown curls bobbing along in front as the carriage drove off polly gave a little bounce on the springy seat and laughed like a delighted child i do like to ride in these nice hacks and see all the fine things and have a good time don't you she said composing herself the next minute as if it suddenly occurred to her that she was going a-visiting not much said tom not minding what he said for the fact that he was shut up with the strange girl suddenly oppressed his soul how's fan why didn't she come too asked polly trying to look demure while her eyes danced in spite of her afraid of spoiling her crinkles and tom smiled for this base betrayal of confidence made him feel his own man again you and i don't mind dampness i'm much obliged to you for coming to take care of me it was kind of polly to say that and tom felt it for his red crop was a tender point and to be associated with polly's pretty brown curls seemed to lessen its coppery glow then he hadn't done anything for her but carry the bag a few steps yet she thanked him he felt grateful and in a burst of confidence offered a handful of peanuts for his pockets were always supplied with this agreeable delicacy and he might be traced anywhere by the trail of shells he left behind him as soon as he had done it he remembered that fanny considered them vulgar and felt that he had disgraced his family so he stuck his head out of the window and kept it there so long that polly asked if anything was the matter who who cares for a countrified little thing like her said tom manfully to himself and then the spirit of mischief entered in and took possession of him he's pretty drunk but i guess he can hold his horses replied this evil-minded boy with an air of calm resignation is the man tipsy oh dear let's get out are the horses bad it's very steep here do you think it's safe cried poor polly making a cocked hat of her little beaver by thrusting it out of the half-open window on her side there's plenty of folks to pick us up if anything happens but perhaps it would be safer if i got out and sat with the man and tom quite beamed with the brilliancy of this sudden mode of relief oh do if you ain't afraid mother would be so anxious if anything should happen to me so far away cried polly much distressed don't you be worried i'll manage the old chap and the horses too and opening the door tom vanished aloft leaving poor victimized polly to quake inside while he placidly revelled in freedom and peanuts outside with the staid old driver fanny came flying down to meet her darling polly as tom presented her with the graceful remark i've got her and the air of a dauntless hunter producing the trophies of his skill 
Polly was instantly whisked upstairs, and having danced a double shuffle on the doormat, Tom retired to the dining room to restore exhausted nature with half a dozen cookies. Aren't you tired to death? Don't you want to lie down? said Fanny, sitting on the side of the bed in Polly's room and chattering hard while she examined everything her friend had on. Not a bit. I had a nice time coming and no trouble except the tipsy coachman but tom got out and kept him in order so i wasn't much frightened answered innocent polly taking off her rough and ready coat and the plain hat without a bit of a feather fiddlesticks he wasn't tipsy and tom only did it to get out of the way he can't bear girls said fanny with a superior air can't he why i thought he was very pleasant and kind and polly opened her eyes with a surprised expression he's an awful boy my dear and if you have anything to do with him he'll torment you to death boys are all horrid but he's the horridest one i ever saw fanny went to a fashionable school where the young ladies were so busy with their french german and italian that there was no time for good english feeling her confidence much shaken in the youth polly privately resolved to let him alone and change the conversation by saying as she looked admiringly about the large handsome room how splendid it is i never slept in a bed with curtains before or had such a fine toilet table as this i'm glad you like it but don't for mercy's sake say such things before the other girls replied fanny wishing polly would wear earrings as every one else did why not asked the country mouse of the city mouse wondering what harm there was in liking other people's pretty things and saying so oh they laugh at everything the least bit odd and that isn't pleasant fanny didn't say countrified but she meant it and polly felt uncomfortable so she shook out her little black silk apron with a thoughtful face and resolved not to allude to her own home if she could help it i'm so poorly mamma says i needn't go to school regularly while you are here only two or three times a week just to keep up my music and french you can go too if you like papa said so do it's such fun cried fanny quite surprising her friend by this unexpected fondness for school i should be afraid if all the girls dress as finely as you do and know as much said polly beginning to feel shy at the thought la child you needn't mind that i'll take care of you and fix you up so you won't look odd am i odd asked polly struck by the word and hoping it didn't mean anything very bad you are a dear and ever so much prettier than you were last summer only you've been brought up differently from us so your ways ain't like ours you see began fanny finding it rather hard to explain how different asked polly again for she liked to understand things well you dress like a little girl for one thing i am a little girl so why shouldn't i and polly looked at her simple blue merino frock stout boots and short hair with a puzzled air you are fourteen and we consider ourselves young ladies at that age continued fanny surveying with complacency the pile of hair on the top of her head with a fringe of fuzz round her forehead and a wavy lock streaming down her back likewise her scarlet and black suit with its big sash little pannier bright buttons points rosettes and heaven knows what there was a locket on her neck earrings tinkling in her ears watch and chain at her belt and several rings on a pair of hands that would have been improved by soap and water polly's eyes went from one little figure to the other and she thought that fanny looked the oddest of the two for polly lived in a quiet country town and knew very little of city fashions she was rather impressed by the elegance about her never having seen fanny's home before as they got acquainted while fanny paid a visit to a friend who lived near polly but she didn't let the contrast between herself and fan trouble her for in a minute she laughed and said contentedly my mother likes me to dress simply and i don't mind i shouldn't know what to do rigged up as you are don't you ever forget to lift your sash and fix those puffy things when you sit down before fanny could answer a scream from below made both listen 
it's only maud she fusses all day long began fanny and the words were hardly out of her mouth when the door was thrown open and a little girl of six or seven came roaring in she stopped at sight of polly stared a minute then took up her roar just where she left it and cast herself into fanny's lap exclaiming wrathfully tom's laughing at me make him stop what did you do to set him going don't scream so you'll frighten polly and fan gave the cherub a shake which produced an explanation i only said we had cold cream at the party last night and he laughed ice cream child and fanny followed tom's reprehensible example i don't care it was cold and i warmed mine at the register and then it was nice only willie bliss spilt it on my new gabrielle and maud wailed again over her accumulated woes do go to katie you're as cross as a little bear to-day said fanny pushing her away katie don't amuse me and i must be amused cause i'm flaxious mamma said i was sobbed maud evidently laboring under the delusion that fractiousness was some interesting malady come down and have dinner that will amuse you and fanny got up pluming herself as a bird does before its flight polly hoped the dreadful boy would not be present but he was and stared at her all dinner-time in a most trying manner mr shaw a busy-looking gentleman said how do you do my dear hope you'll enjoy yourself and then appeared to forget her entirely mrs shaw a pale nervous woman greeted her little guest kindly and took care that she wanted for nothing madame shaw a quiet old lady with an imposing cap exclaimed on seeing polly bless my heart the image of her mother a sweet woman how is she dear and kept peering at the newcomer over her glasses till between madame and tom poor polly lost her appetite fanny chatted like a magpie and maud fidgeted till tom proposed to put her under the big dish-cover which produced such an explosion that the young lady was borne screaming away by the much enduring katie it was altogether an uncomfortable dinner and polly was very glad when it was over they all went about their own affairs and after doing the honors of the house fan was called to the dressmaker leaving polly to amuse herself in the great drawing-room polly was glad to be alone for a few minutes and having examined all the pretty things about her began to walk up and down over the soft flowery carpet humming to herself as the daylight faded and only the ruddy glow of the fire filled the room presently madame came slowly in and sat down in her armchair saying that's a fine old tune sing it to me my dear i haven't heard it this many a day polly didn't like to sing before strangers for she had had no teaching but such as her busy mother could give her but she had been taught the utmost respect for old people and having no reason for refusing she directly went to the piano and did as she was bid that's the sort of music it's a pleasure to hear sing some more dear said madame in her gentle way when she had done pleased with this praise polly sang away in a fresh little voice that went straight to the listener's heart and nestled there the sweet old tunes that one is never tired of were all polly's store and her favorites were scotch airs such as yellow-haired laddie jock o hazeldean down among the heather and burks of aberfeldy the more she sung the better she did it and when she wound up with a health to king charlie the room quite rung with the stirring music made by the big piano and the little maid by george that's a jolly tune sing it again please cried tom's voice and there was tom's red head bobbing up over the high back of the chair where he had hidden himself it gave polly quite a turn for she thought no one was hearing her but the old lady dozing by the fire i can't sing any more i'm tired she said and walked away to madame in the other room 
the red head vanished like a meteor for polly's tone had been decidedly cool the old lady put out her hand and drawing polly to her knee looked into her face with such kind eyes that polly forgot the impressive cap and smiled at her confidingly for she saw that her simple music had pleased her listener and she felt glad to know it you mustn't mind my staring dear said madam softly pinching her rosy cheek i haven't seen a little girl for so long it does my old eyes good to look at you polly thought that a very odd speech and couldn't help saying aren't fan and maud little girls too oh dear no not what i call little girls fan has been a young lady this two years and maud is a spoiled baby your mother's a very sensible woman my child what a very queer old lady thought polly but she said yes am respectfully and looked at the fire you don't understand what i mean do you asked madam still holding her by the chin no am not quite well dear i'll tell you in my day children of fourteen and fifteen didn't dress in the height of fashion go to parties as nearly like those of grown people as it's possible to make them lead idle giddy unhealthy lives and get blasé at twenty we were little folks till eighteen or so worked and studied dressed and played like children honoured our parents and our days were much longer in the land than now it seems to me the old lady appeared to forget polly at the end of her speech for she sat patting the plump little hand that lay in her own and looking up at a faded picture of an old gentleman with a ruffled shirt and a queue was he your father madam yes dear my honoured father i did up his frills to the day of his death and the first money i ever earned was five dollars which he offered as a prize to whichever of his six girls would lay the handsomest down in his silk stockings how proud you must have been cried polly leaning on the old lady's knee with an interested face yes and we all learned to make bread and cook and wore little chintz gowns and were as gay and hearty as kittens all live to be grandmothers and fathers and i'm the last seventy next birthday my dear and not worn out yet though daughter shaw is an invalid at forty that's the way i was brought up and that's why fan calls me old-fashioned i suppose tell me more about your papa please i like it said polly say father we never called him papa and if one of my brothers had addressed him as governor as boys do now i really think he'd have cut him off with a shilling madam raised her voice in saying this and nodded significantly but a mild snore from the other room seemed to assure her that it was a waste of shot to fire in that direction before she could continue in came fanny with the joyful news that clara bird had invited them both to go to the theatre with her that very evening and would call for them at seven o'clock polly was so excited by this sudden plunge into the dissipations of city life that she flew about like a distracted butterfly and hardly knew what had happened till she found herself seated before the great green curtain in the brilliant theatre old mr bird sat on one side fanny on the other and both let her alone for which she was very grateful as her whole attention was so absorbed in the scene around her that she couldn't talk polly had never been much to the theatre and the few plays she had seen were the good old fairy tales dramatized to suit young beholders lively bright and full of the harmless nonsense which brings the laugh without the blush 
that night she saw one of the new spectacles which have lately become the rage and run for hundreds of nights dazzling exciting and demoralizing the spectator by every allurement french ingenuity can invent and american prodigality execute never mind what its name was it was very gorgeous very vulgar and very fashionable so of course it was much admired and every one went to see it at first polly thought she had got into fairyland and saw only the sparkling creatures who danced and sung in a world of light and beauty but presently she began to listen to the songs and conversation and then the illusion vanished for the lovely phantoms sang negro melodies talked slang and were a disgrace to the good old-fashioned elves whom she knew and loved so well our little girl was too innocent to understand half the jokes and often wondered what people were laughing at but as the first enchantment subsided polly began to feel uncomfortable to be sure her mother wouldn't like to have her there and to wish she hadn't come somehow things seemed to get worse and worse as the play went on for our small spectator was being rapidly enlightened by the gossip going on all about her as well as by her own quick eyes and girlish instincts when four-and-twenty girls dressed as jockeys came prancing on to the stage cracking their whips stamping the heels of their top boots and winking at the audience polly did not think it at all funny but looked disgusted and was glad when they were gone but when another set appeared in a costume consisting of gauze wings and a bit of gold fringe round the waist poor unfashionable polly didn't know what to do for she felt both frightened and indignant and sat with her eyes on her playbill and her cheeks getting hotter and hotter every minute what are you blushing so for asked fanny as the painted sylphs vanished i'm so ashamed of those girls whispered polly taking a long breath of relief you little goose it's just the way it was done in paris and the dancing is splendid it seems queer at first but you'll get used to it as i did i'll never come again said polly decidedly for her innocent nature rebelled against the spectacle which as yet gave her more pain than pleasure she did not know how easy it was to get used to it as fanny did and it was well for her that the temptation was not often offered she could not explain the feeling but she was glad when the play was done and they were safe at home where kind grandma was waiting to see them comfortably into bed did you have a good time dear she asked looking at polly's feverish cheeks and excited eyes i don't wish to be rude but i didn't answered polly some of it was splendid but a good deal of it made me want to go under the seat people seemed to like it but i don't think it was proper as polly freed her mind and emphasized her opinion with a decided rap of the boot she had just taken off fanny laughed and said while she pirouetted about the room like mademoiselle therese polly was shocked grandma her eyes were as big as saucers her face as red as my sash and once i thought she was going to cry some of it was rather queer but of course it was proper or all our set wouldn't go i heard mrs smythe perkins say it was charming so like dear paris and she has lived abroad so of course she knows what is what i don't care if she has i know it wasn't proper for little girls to see or i shouldn't have been so ashamed cried sturdy polly perplexed but not convinced even by mrs smythe perkins i think you are right my dear but you have lived in the country and haven't yet learned that modesty has gone out of fashion and with a good-night kiss grandma left polly to dream dreadfully of dancing in jockey costume on a great stage while tom played a big drum in the orchestra and the audience all wore the faces of her father and mother looking sorrowfully at her with eyes like saucers and faces as red as fanny's sash End of chapter one
Chapter Two of An Old Fashioned Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Two New Fashions. I'm going to school this morning, so come up and get ready said fanny a day or two after as she left the late breakfast table you look very nice what have you got to do asked polly following her into the hall prink half an hour and put on her wad answered the irreverent tom whose preparations for school consisted in flinging his cap on to his head and strapping up several big books that looked as if they were sometimes used as weapons of defence what is a wad asked polly while fanny marched up without deigning any reply somebody's hair on the top of her head in the place where it ought not to be and tom went whistling away with an air of sublime indifference as to the state of his own curly pow why must you be so fine to go to school asked polly watching fan arrange the little frizzles on her forehead and settle the various streamers and festoons belonging to her dress all the girls do and it's proper for you never know who you may meet i'm going to walk after my lessons so i wish you'd wear your best hat and sack answered fanny trying to stick her own hat on at an angle which defied all the laws of gravitation i will if you don't think this is nice enough i like the other best because it has a feather but this is warmer so i wear it every day and polly ran into her own room to prink also fearing that her friend might be ashamed of her plain costume won't your hands be cold in kid gloves she said as they went down the snowy street with a north wind blowing in their faces yes horrid cold but my muff is so big i won't carry it mamma won't have it cut up and my ermine one must be kept for best and fanny smoothed her bismarck kids with an injured air i suppose my gray squirrel is ever so much too big but it's nice and cosy and you may warm your hands in it if you want to said polly surveying her new woolen gloves with a dissatisfied look though she had thought them quite elegant before perhaps i will by and by now polly don't you be shy i'll only introduce two or three of the girls and you needn't mind old monsieur a bit or read if you don't want to we shall be in the anteroom so you'll only see about a dozen and they will be so busy they won't mind you much i guess i won't read but sit and look on i like to watch people everything is so new and queer here but polly did feel and look very shy when she was ushered into a room full of young ladies as they seemed to her all very much dressed all talking together and all turning to examine the newcomer with a cool stare which seemed to be as much the fashion as eyeglasses they nodded affably when fanny introduced her said something civil and made room for her at the table round which they sat waiting for monsieur several of the more frolicsome were imitating the grecian bend some were putting their heads together over little notes nearly all were eating confectionery and the entire twelve chattered like magpies being politely supplied with caramels polly sat looking and listening feeling very young and countrified among these elegant young ladies girls do you know that carrie has gone abroad there has been so much talk her father couldn't bear it and took the whole family off isn't that gay said one lively damsel who had just come in i should think they'd better go my mamma says if i'd been going to that school she'd have taken me straight away answered another girl with an important air carrie ran away with an italian music teacher and it got into the papers and made a great stir explained the first speaker to polly who looked mystified how dreadful cried polly i think it was fun she was only sixteen and he was perfectly splendid and she has plenty of money and everyone talked about it and when she went anywhere people looked you know and she liked it but her papa is an old poke so he sent them all away it's too bad for she was the jolliest thing i ever knew polly had nothing to say to lively miss bell but fanny observed 
I like to read about such things, but it's so inconvenient to have it happen right here because it makes it harder for us. I wish you could have heard my papa go on. He threatened to send a maid to school with me every day as they do in New York to be sure I come all right. Did you ever? That's because it came out that Carrie used to forge excuses in her mama's name and go promenading with her Oreste when they thought her safe at school. Oh, wasn't she a sly minx? cried Belle, as if she rather admired the trick. I think a little fun is all right, and there's no need of making a talk if now and then someone does run off like Carrie. Boys do as they like, and I don't see why girls need to be kept so dreadfully close. I'd like to see anybody watching and guarding me, added another dashing young lady. It would take a policeman to do that, Trix, or a little man in a tall hat, said Fanny, slyly, which caused a general laugh and made Beatrice toss her head coquettishly. Oh, have you read the phantom bride it's perfectly thrilling there's a regular rush for it at the library but some prefer breaking a butterfly which do you like best asked a pale girl of polly in one of the momentary lulls which occurred i haven't read either you must then i adore guy livingston's books and yates weeders are my delight only they are so long i get worn out before i'm through i haven't read anything but one of the mulbach novels since i came i like those because there's history in them said polly glad to have a word to say for herself those are well enough for improving reading but i like real exciting novels don't you Polly was spared the mortification of owning that she had never read any by the appearance of Monsieur, a grey-headed old Frenchman, who went through his task with the resigned air of one who was used to being the victim of giggling schoolgirls. The young ladies gabbled over the lesson, wrote an exercise, and read a little French history, but it did not seem to make much impression upon them, though Monsieur was very ready to explain, and Polly quite blushed for her friend when, on being asked what famous Frenchman fought in our revolution, she answered La Martine instead of Lafayette. The hour was soon over, and when Fan had taken a music lesson in another room, while Polly looked on, it was time for recess. The younger girls walked up and down the court, arm in arm, eating bread and butter. Others stayed in the schoolroom to read and gossip, but Belle, Trix, and Fanny went to lunch at a fashionable ice-cream saloon nearby, and Polly meekly followed, not daring to hint at the gingerbread Grandma had put in her pocket for luncheon. So the honest brown cookies crumbled away in obscurity, while Polly tried to satisfy her hearty appetite on one ice and three macaroons. The girls seemed in great spirits, particularly after they were joined by a short gentleman with such a young face that Polly would have called him a boy if he had not worn a tall beaver. Escorted by this impressive youth, Fanny left her unfortunate friends to return to school and went to walk, as she called a slow promenade down the most crowded streets. Polly discreetly fell behind, and amused herself looking into shop windows, till Fanny, mindful of her manners, even at such an interesting time, took her into a picture gallery, and bade her enjoy the works of art while they rested. Obedient Polly went through the rooms several times, apparently examining the pictures with the interest of a connoisseur, and trying not to hear the mild prattle of the pair on the round seat but she couldn't help wondering what Fan found so absorbing in an account of a recent German, and why she need promise so solemnly not to forget the concert that afternoon. When Fanny rose at last, Polly's tired face reproached her, and taking a hasty leave of the small gentleman, she turned homeward, saying, confidentially, as she put one hand in Polly's muff, now, my dear, you mustn't say a word about Frank Moore, or Papa will take my head off. I don't care a bit for him, and he likes tricks, only they have quarreled, and he wants to make her mad by flirting a little with me. I scolded him well, and he promised to make up with her. We all go to the afternoon concerts and have a gay time, and Belle and Trix are to be there today. So just keep quiet, and everything will be all right. I'm afraid it won't, 
began polly who not being used to secrets found it very hard to keep even a small one don't worry child it's none of our business so we can go and enjoy the music and if other people flirt it won't be our fault said fanny impatiently of course not but then if your father don't like you to do so ought you to go i tell mamma and she don't care papa is fussy and grandma makes a stir about every blessed thing i do you will hold your tongue won't you yes i truly will i never tell tales and polly kept her word feeling sure fan didn't mean to deceive her father since she told her mother everything who are you going with asked mrs shaw when fanny mentioned that it was concert day just before three o'clock only polly she likes music and it was so stormy i couldn't go last week you know answered fan adding as they left the house again if any one meets us on the way i can't help it can i you can tell them not to can't you that's rude dear me here's bell's brother gus he always goes is my hair all right and my hat before polly could answer mr gus joined them as a matter of course and polly soon found herself trotting on behind feeling that things were not all right though she didn't know how to mend them being fond of music she ignorantly supposed that every one else went for that alone and was much disturbed by the whispering that went on among the young people round her bell and trix were there in full dress and in the pauses between different pieces messrs frank and gus with several other splendid fellows regaled the young ladies with college gossip and bits of news full of interest to judge from the close attention paid to their eloquent remarks polly regarded these noble beings with awe and they recognized her existence with the condescension of their sex but they evidently considered her only a quiet little thing and finding her not up to society talk blandly ignored the pretty child and devoted themselves to the young ladies fortunately for polly she forgot all about them in her enjoyment of the fine music which she felt rather than understood and sat listening with such a happy face that several true music lovers watched her smilingly for her heart gave a blithe welcome to the melody which put the little instrument in tune it was dusk when they went out and polly was much relieved to find the carriage waiting for them because playing third fiddle was not to her taste and she had had enough of it for one day i'm glad those men are gone they did worry me so talking when i wanted to hear said polly as they rolled away which did you like best asked fanny with a languid air of superiority the plain one who didn't say much he picked up my muff when it tumbled down and took care of me in the crowd the others didn't mind anything about me they thought you were a little girl i suppose my mother says a real gentleman is as polite to a little girl as to a woman so i like mr sidney best because he was kind to me what a sharp child you are polly i shouldn't have thought you'd mind things like that said fanny beginning to understand that there may be a good deal of womanliness even in a little girl i'm used to good manners though i do live in the country replied polly rather warmly for she didn't like to be patronized even by her friends grandma says your mother is a perfect lady and you are just like her so don't get in a passion with those poor fellows and i'll see that they behave better next time tom has no manners at all and you don't complain of him added fan with a laugh i don't care if he hasn't he's a boy and acts like one and i can get on with him a great deal better than i can with those men fanny was just going to take polly to task for saying those men in such a disrespectful tone when both were startled by a smothered cock-a-doodle-doo from under the opposite seat it's tom cried fanny and with the words out tumbled that incorrigible boy red in the face and breathless with suppressed laughter seating himself he surveyed the girls as if well satisfied with the success of his prank and waiting to be congratulated upon it did you hear what we were saying demanded fanny uneasily oh didn't i every word and tom exulted over them visibly did you ever see such a provoking toad polly now i suppose you'll go and tell papa a great story perhaps i shall and perhaps i shan't how polly did hop when i crowed i heard her squeal and saw her cuddle up her feet 
"'And you heard us praise your manners, didn't you?' asked Polly, slyly. "'Yes, and you liked them, so I won't tell on you,' said Tom, with a reassuring nod. "'There's nothing to tell.' "'Ain't there, though? What do you suppose the governor will say to you girls going on so with those dandies? I saw you.' "'What has the governor of Massachusetts to do with us?' asked Polly, trying to look as if she meant what she said. Pooh, you know who I mean. So you needn't try to catch me up as Grandma does. Tom, I'll make a bargain with you, cried Fanny eagerly. It wasn't my fault that Gus and Frank were there, and I couldn't help their speaking to me. I do as well as I can, and Papa needn't be angry, for I behave ever so much better than some of the girls, don't I, Polly? Bargain? observed Tom, with an eye to business. If you won't go and make a fuss telling what you'd no right to hear, it was so mean to hide and listen, I should think you'd be ashamed of it. I'll help you tease for your velocipede and won't say a word against it when Mama and Granny beg Papa not to let you have it. Will you? And Tom paused to consider the offer in all its bearings. Yes, and Polly will help, won't you? I'd rather not have anything to do with it, but I'll be quiet and not do any harm. Why won't you? asked Tom, curiously. Because it seems like deceiving. Well, Papa needn't be so fussy, said Fan, petulantly. After hearing about that carry and the rest, I don't wonder he is fussy. Why don't you tell right out not do it any more if he don't want you to? said Polly, persuasively. Do you go and tell your father and mother everything right out? Yes, I do, and it saves ever so much trouble. Ain't you afraid of them? Of course I'm not. It's hard to tell sometimes, but it's so comfortable when it's over. Let's, was Tom's brief advice. Mercy me, what a fuss about nothing, said Fanny, ready to cry with vexation. Tis nothing. You know you are forbidden to go gallivanting round with those chaps, and that's the reason you're in a pucker now. I won't make any bargain, and I will tell returned tom seized with a sudden fit of moral firmness will you if i promise never never to do so any more asked fanny meekly for when thomas took matters into his own hands his sister usually submitted in spite of herself i'll think about it and if you behave maybe i won't do it at all i can watch you better than papa can so if you try it again it's all up with you miss said tom finding it impossible to resist the pleasure of tyrannizing a little when he got the chance. "'She won't. Don't plague her any more. And she will be good to you when you get into scrapes,' answered Polly, with her arm round Fan. "'I never do. And if I did, I shouldn't ask a girl to help me out.' "'Why not? I'd ask you in a minute if I was in trouble,' said Polly, in her confiding way. "'Would you? Well, I'd put you through.' as sure as my name's Tom Shaw. Now then, don't slip, Polly. And Mr. Thomas helped them out with unusual politeness, for that friendly little speech gratified him. He felt that one person appreciated him, and it had a good effect upon manners and temper made rough and belligerent by constant snubbing and opposition. After tea that evening, Fanny proposed that Polly should show her how to make molasses candy, as it was Cook's holiday and the coast would be clear. Hoping to propitiate her tormentor, Fan invited Tom to join in the revel, and Polly begged that Maud might sit up and see the fun. So all four descended to the big kitchen, armed with aprons, hammers, spoons, and pans, and Polly assumed command of the forces. Tom was set to cracking nuts, and Maud to picking out the meats, for the candy was to be tip-top. Fan waited on Polly, cook, who hovered over the kettle of boiling molasses till her face was the color of a peony. "'Now put in the nuts,' she said at last, and Tom emptied his plate into the foamy syrup, while the others watched with deep interest the mysterious concoction of this well-beloved sweetmeat." i pour it into the buttered pan you see and it cools and then we can eat it explained polly suiting the action to the word why it's all full of shells exclaimed maud peering into the pan oh thunder i must have put em in by mistake and ate up the meats without thinking 
said tom trying to conceal his naughty satisfaction as the girls hung over the pan with faces full of disappointment and despair you did it on purpose you horrid boy i'll never let you have anything to do with my fun again cried fan in a passion trying to catch and shake him while he dodged and chuckled in high glee maud began to wail over her lost delight and polly gravely poked at the mess which was quite spoilt but her attention was speedily diverted by the squabble going on in the corner for fanny forgetful of her young ladyism and her sixteen years had boxed tom's ears and tom resenting the insult had forcibly seated her in the coal hod where he held her with one hand while he returned the compliment with the other both were very angry and kept twitting one another with every aggravation they could invent as they scolded and scuffled presenting a most unlovely spectacle polly was not a model girl by any means and had her little pets and tempers like the rest of us but she didn't fight scream and squabble with her brothers and sisters in this disgraceful way and was much surprised to see her elegant friend in such a passion oh don't please don't you'll hurt her tom let him go fanny it's no matter about the candy we can make some more cried polly trying to part them and looking so distressed that they stopped ashamed and in a minute sorry that she should see such a display of temper i ain't going to be hustled round so you'd better let me alone fan said tom drawing off with a threatening wag of the head adding in a different tone i only put the shells in for fun polly you cook another kettleful and i'll pick you some meats all fair will you it's pretty hot work and it's a pity to waste things but i'll try again if you want me to said polly with a patient sigh for her arms were tired and her face uncomfortably hot we don't want you get away said maud shaking a sticky spoon at him keep quiet crybaby i'm going to stay and help mayn't i polly bears like sweet things so you want some candy i guess where's the molasses we've used up all there was in the jug said polly good-naturedly beginning again down cellar i'll get it and taking the lamp and jug tom departed bent on doing his duty now like a saint the moment his light vanished fanny bolted the door saying spitefully now we are safe from any more tricks let him thump and call it only serves him right and when the candy is done we'll let the rascal out how can we make it without molasses asked polly thinking that would settle the matter there's plenty in the storeroom no you shan't let him up till i'm ready he's got to learn that i'm not to be shaken by a little chit like him make your candy and let him alone or i'll go and tell papa and then tom will get a lecture Polly thought it wasn't fair, but Maud clamored for her candy, and finding she could do nothing to appease Fan, Polly devoted her mind to her cookery till the nuts were safely in, and a nice panful set in the yard to cool. A few bangs at the locked door, a few threats of vengeance from the prisoner, such as setting the house on fire, drinking up the wine, and mashing the jelly pots, and then all was so quiet that the girls forgot him in the exciting crisis of their work. "'He can't possibly get out anywhere, and as soon as we've cut up the candy, we'll unbolt the door and run. Come and get a nice dish to put it in.' said fan when polly proposed to go halves with tom lest he should come bursting in somehow and seize the whole when they came down with the dish in which to set forth their treat and opened the back door to find it imagine their dismay on discovering that it was gone pan candy and all utterly and mysteriously gone a general lament arose when a careful rummage left no hopes for the fates had evidently decreed that candy was not to prosper on this unpropitious night the hot pan has melted and sunk in the snow perhaps said fanny digging into the drift where it was left those old cats have got it i guess suggested maud too much overwhelmed by this second blow to howl as usual the gate isn't locked and some beggar has stolen it i hope it will do him good added polly turning from her exploring expedition 
If Tom could get out, I should think he'd carried it off, but not being a rat, he can't go through the bits of windows, so it wasn't him, said Fanny disconsolately, for she began to think this double loss a punishment for letting angry passions rise. Let's open the door and tell him about it, proposed Polly. He'll crow over us. No, we'll open it and go to bed, and he can come out when he likes. Provoking boy! If he hadn't plagued us so, we should have had a nice time. Unbolting the cellar door, the girls announced to the invisible captive that they were through, and then departed much depressed. Halfway up the second flight, they all stopped as suddenly as if they had seen a ghost, for looking over the banisters was Tom's face, crocky but triumphant, and in either hand a junk of candy, which he waved above them as he vanished, with the tantalizing remark, "'Don't you wish you had some?' "'How in the world did he get out?' cried Fanny, steadying herself after a start that nearly sent all three tumbling downstairs. "'Coal hole,' answered a spectral voice from the gloom above. "'Good gracious! He must have poked up the cover, climbed into the street, stole the candy, and sneaked in at the shed window while we were looking for it.' "'Cats got it, didn't they?' jeered the voice in a tone that made Polly sit down and laugh till she couldn't laugh any longer. "'Just give Maud a bit. She's so disappointed. Fan and I are sick of it. And so will you be if you eat it all,' called Polly when she got her breath. "'Go to bed, Maudie, and look under your pillow when you get there,' was the oracular reply that came down to them as Tom's door closed after a jubilant solo on the tin pan. The girls went to bed tired out, and Maud slumbered placidly, hugging the sticky bundle, found where molasses candy is not often discovered. Polly was very tired and soon fell asleep, but Fanny, who slept with her, lay awake longer than usual, thinking about her troubles, for her head ached, and the dissatisfaction that follows anger would not let her rest with the tranquillity that made the rosy face in the little round nightcap such a pleasant sight to see as it lay beside her. The gas was turned down, but Fanny saw a figure in a gray wrapper creep by her door, and presently return, pausing to look in. "'Who is it?' she cried, so loud that Polly woke. "'Only me, dear.' answered grandma's mild voice poor tom has got a dreadful toothache and i came down to find some creosote for him he told me not to tell you but i can't find the bottle and don't want to disturb mamma it's in my closet old tom will pay for his trick this time said fanny in a satisfied tone i thought he'd get enough of our candy laughed polly and then they fell asleep leaving tom to the delights of toothache and the tender mercies of kind old grandma end of chapter two chapter three of an old-fashioned girl this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott Chapter 3 Polly's Troubles Polly soon found that she was in a new world, a world where the manners and customs were so different from the simple ways at home that she felt like a stranger in a strange land, and often wished that she had not come. In the first place, she had nothing to do but lounge and gossip, read novels, parade the streets, and dress, and before a week was gone she was as heartily sick of all this as a healthy person would be who attempted to live on confectionery. Fanny liked it because she was used to it, and had never known anything better, but Polly had, and often felt like a little wood-bird shut up in a gilded cage. Nevertheless, she was much impressed by the luxuries all about her, enjoyed them, wished she owned them, and wondered why the Shaws were not a happier family. 
she was not wise enough to know where the trouble lay she did not attempt to say which of the two lives was the right one she only knew which she liked best and supposed it was merely another of her old-fashioned ways fanny's friends did not interest her much she was rather afraid of them they seemed so much older and wiser than herself even those younger in years they talked about things of which she knew nothing and when fanny tried to explain she didn't find them interesting indeed some of them rather shocked and puzzled her so the girls let her alone being civil when they met but evidently feeling that she was too odd to belong to their set then she turned to maud for companionship for her own little sister was excellent company and polly loved her dearly but miss maud was much absorbed in her own affairs for she belonged to a set also and these mites of five and six had their musicals their parties receptions and promenades as well as their elders and the chief idea of their little lives seemed to be to ape the fashionable follies they should have been too innocent to understand maud had her tiny card-case and paid calls like mamma and fan her box of dainty gloves her jewel drawer her crimping pins as fine and fanciful a wardrobe as a paris doll and a french maid to dress her polly couldn't get on with her at first for maud didn't seem like a child and often corrected polly in her conversation and manners though little mademoiselle's own were anything but perfect now and then when maud felt poorly or had a Quaxious. turn for she had nerves as well as mamma she would go to polly to be amused for her gentle ways and kind forbearance soothed the little fine lady better than anything else polly enjoyed these times and told stories played games or went out walking just as maud liked slowly and surely winning the child's heart and relieving the whole house of the young tyrant who ruled it tom soon got over staring at polly and at first did not take much notice of her for in his opinion girls didn't amount much anyway and considering the style of girl he knew most about polly quite agreed with him he occasionally refreshed himself by teasing her to see how she'd stand it and caused polly much anguish of spirit for she never knew where he would take her next he bounced out at her from behind doors booed at her in dark entries clutched her feet as she went upstairs startled her by shrill whistles right in her ear or sudden tweaks of the hair as he passed her in the street and as sure as there was company to dinner he fixed his round eyes on her and never took them off till she was reduced to a piteous state of confusion and distress she used to beg him not to plague her but he said he did it for her good she was too shy and needed toughening like the other girls in vain she protested that she didn't want to be like the other girls in that respect he only laughed in her face stuck his red hair straight up all over his head and glared at her till she fled in dismay yet polly rather liked tom for she soon saw that he was neglected hustled out of the way and left to get on pretty much by himself she often wondered why his mother didn't pet him as she did the girls why his father ordered him about as if he was a born rebel and took so little interest in his only son fanny considered him a bear and was ashamed of him but never tried to polish him up a bit and maud and he lived together like a cat and dog who did not belong to a happy family grandma was the only one who stood by poor old tom and polly more than once discovered him doing something kind for madam and seeming very much ashamed when it was found out he wasn't respectful at all he called her the old lady and told her he wouldn't be fussed over but when anything was the matter he always went to the old lady and was very grateful for the fussing polly liked him for this and often wanted to speak of it but she had a feeling that it wouldn't do 
for in praising their affection she was reproaching others with neglect so she held her tongue and thought about it all the more grandma was rather neglected too and perhaps that is the reason why tom and she were such good friends she was even more old-fashioned than polly but people didn't seem to mind it so much in her as her day was supposed to be over and nothing was expected of her but to keep out of everybody's way and to be handsomely dressed when she appeared before people grandma led a quiet solitary life in her own rooms full of old furniture pictures books and relics of a past for which no one cared but herself her son went up every evening for a little call was very kind to her and saw that she wanted nothing money could buy but he was a busy man so intent on getting rich that he had no time to enjoy what he already possessed madame never complained interfered or suggested but there was a sad sort of quietude about her a wistful look in her faded eyes as if she wanted something which money could not buy and when children were near she hovered about them evidently longing to cuddle and caress them as only grandmothers can polly felt this and as she missed the home petting gladly showed that she liked to see the quiet old face brighten as she entered the solitary room where few children came except the phantoms of little sons and daughters who to the motherly heart that loved them never faded or grew up polly wished the children would be kinder to grandma but it was not for her to tell them so although it troubled her a good deal and she could only try to make up for it by being as dutiful and affectionate as if their grandma was her own another thing that disturbed polly was the want of exercise to dress up and parade certain streets for an hour every day to stand talking in doorways or drive out in a fine carriage was not the sort of exercise she liked and fan would take no other indeed she was so shocked when polly one day proposed a run down the mall that her friend never dared suggest such a thing again at home polly ran and rode coasted and skated jumped rope and raked hay worked in her garden and rowed her boat so no wonder she longed for something more lively than a daily promenade with a flock of giddy girls who tilted along in high-heeled boots and costumes which made polly ashamed to be seen with some of them so she used to slip out alone sometimes when fanny was absorbed in novels company or millinery and get fine brisk walks round the park on the unfashionable side where the babies took their airings or she went inside to watch the boys coasting and to wish she could coast too as she did at home she never went far and always came back rosy and gay one afternoon just before dinner she felt so tired of doing nothing that she slipped out for a run it had been a dull day but the sun was visible now setting brightly below the clouds it was cold but still and polly trotted down the smooth snow-covered mall humming to herself and trying not to feel homesick the coasters were at it with all their might and she watched them till her longing to join the fun grew irresistible on the hill some little girls were playing with their sleds real little girls in warm hoods and coats rubber boots and mittens and polly felt drawn toward them in spite of her fear of fan i want to go down but i daren't it's so steep said one of these common children as maud called them if you'll lend me your sled and sit in my lap i'll take you down all nice answered polly in a confidential tone the little girls took a look at her seemed satisfied and accepted her offer polly looked carefully round to see that no fashionable eye beheld the awful deed and finding all safe settled her freight and spun away downhill feeling all over the delightsome excitement of swift motion which makes coasting such a favorite pastime with the more sensible portion of the child world 
one after another she took the little girls down the hill and dragged them up again while they regarded her in the light of a grey-coated angel descended for their express benefit polly was just finishing off with one delicious go all by herself when she heard a familiar whistle behind her and before she could get off up came tom looking as much astonished as if he had found her mounted on an elephant hello polly what'll fan say to you was his polished salutation don't know and don't care coasting is no harm I like it, and I'm going to do it now I've got a chance. So clear the lula. And away went independent Polly, with her hair blowing in the wind, and an expression of genuine enjoyment, which a very red nose didn't damage in the least. Good for you, Polly. And casting himself upon his sled, with the most reckless disregard for his ribs, off whizzed Tom after her, and came alongside just as she reined up General Grant on the broad path below. "'Oh, won't you get it when you go home?' cried the young gentleman, even before he changed his graceful attitude. "'I shan't, if you don't go and tell. But of course you will.' added polly sitting still while an anxious expression began to steal over her happy face i just won't then returned tom with the natural perversity of his tribe if they ask me i shall tell of course if they don't ask i think there's no harm in keeping still i shouldn't have done it if i hadn't known my mother was willing but i don't wish to trouble your mother by telling of it do you think it was very dreadful of me asked polly looking at him i think it was downright jolly and i won't tell if you don't want me to now come up and have another said tom heartily just one more the little girls want to go this is their sled let em take it it isn't good for much and you come on mine mazeppa's a stunner you see if he isn't so polly tucked herself up in front tom hung on behind in some mysterious manner and mazeppa proved that he fully merited his master's sincere if inelegant praise they got on capitally now for tom was in his proper sphere and showed his best side being civil and gay in the bluff boy fashion that was natural to him while polly forgot to be shy and liked this sort of toughening much better than the other they laughed and talked and kept taking just one more till the sunshine was all gone and the clock struck dinner-time we shall be late let's run said polly as they came into the path after the last coast you just sit still and i'll get you home in a jiffy and before she could unpack herself tom trotted off with her at a fine pace here's a pair of cheeks i wish you'd get a color like this fanny said mr shaw as polly came into the dining-room after smoothing her hair your nose is as red as that cranberry sauce answered fan coming out of the big chair where she had been curled up for an hour or two deep in lady audley's secret so it is said polly shutting one eye to look at the offending feature never mind i've had a good time anyway she added giving a little prance in her chair i don't see much fun in these cold runs you are so fond of taking said fanny with a yawn and a shiver perhaps you would if you tried it and polly laughed as she glanced at tom did you go alone dear asked grandma patting the rosy cheek beside her yes am but i met tom and we came home together polly's eyes twinkled when she said that and tom choked in his soup thomas leave the table commanded mr shaw as his incorrigible son gurgled and gasped behind his napkin please don't send him away sir i made him laugh said polly penitently what's the joke asked fanny waking up at last i shouldn't think you'd make him laugh when he's always making you cry observed maud who had just come in what have you been doing now sir demanded mr shaw as tom emerged red and solemn from his brief obscurity nothing but coast he said gruffly for papa was always lecturing him and letting the girls do just as they liked 
so's polly i saw her me and blanche were coming home just now and we saw her and tom riding down the hill on his sled and then he dragged her ever so far cried maud with her mouth full you didn't and fanny dropped her fork with a scandalized face yes i did and liked it ever so much answered polly looking anxious but resolute did any one see you cried fanny only some little girls and tom it was horridly improper and tom ought to have told you so if you didn't know any better i should be mortified to death if any of my friends saw you added fan much disturbed now don't you scold it's no harm and polly shall coast if she wants to mayn't she grandma cried tom gallantly coming to the rescue and securing a powerful ally my mother lets me and if i don't go among the boys i can't see what harm there is in it said polly before madam could speak people do many things in the country that are not proper here began mrs shaw in her reproving tone let the child do it if she likes and take maud with her i should be glad to have one hearty girl in my house interrupted mr shaw and that was the end of it thank you sir said polly gratefully and nodded at tom who telegraphed back all right and fell upon his dinner with the appetite of a young wolf oh you sly boots you're getting up a flirtation with tom are you whispered fanny to her friend as if much amused what and polly looked so surprised and indignant that fanny was ashamed of herself and changed the subject by telling her mother she needed some new gloves polly was very quiet after that and the minute dinner was over she left the room to go and have a quiet think about the whole matter before she got halfway upstairs she saw tom coming after and immediately sat down to guard her feet he laughed and said as he perched himself on the post of the banisters i won't grab you honor bright i just wanted to say if you'll come out tomorrow sometime we'll have a good coast no said polly i can't come why not are you mad i didn't tell and tom looked amazed at the change which had come over her no you kept your word and stood by me like a good boy i'm not mad either but i don't mean to coast any more your mother don't like it that isn't the reason i know you nodded to me after she'd freed her mind and you meant to go then come now what is it i shan't tell you but i'm not going was polly's determined answer well i did think you had more sense than most girls but you haven't and i wouldn't give a sixpence for you that's polite said polly getting ruffled well i hate cowards i ain't a coward yes you are you're afraid of what folks will say ain't you now polly knew she was and held her peace though she longed to speak but how could she ah i knew you'd back out and tom walked away with an air of scorn that cut polly to the heart it's too bad just as he was growing kind to me and i was going to have a good time it's all spoilt by fan's nonsense mrs shaw don't like it nor grandma either i dare say there'll be a fuss if i go and fan will plague me so i'll give it up and let tom think i'm afraid oh dear i never did see such ridiculous people polly shut her door hard and felt ready to cry with vexation that her pleasure should be spoiled by such a silly idea for of all the silly freaks of this vast age that of little people playing at love is about the silliest polly had been taught that it was a very serious and sacred thing and according to her notions it was far more improper to flirt with one boy than to coast with a dozen she had been much amazed only the day before to hear maud say to her mother mamma must i have a beau the girls all do and say i ought to have freddy lovell but i don't like him as well as howie fisk oh yes i'd have a little sweetheart dear it's so cunning answered mrs shaw and maud announced soon after that she was engaged to freddy cause howie slapped her when she proposed the match 
Polly laughed with the rest at the time, but when she thought of it afterward, and wondered what her own mother would have said if little Kitty had put such a question, she didn't find it cunning or funny, but ridiculous and unnatural. She felt so now about herself, and when her first petulance was over, resolved to give up coasting and everything else rather than have any nonsense with Tom, who, thanks to his neglected education, was as ignorant as herself of the charms of this new amusement for school children. So Polly tried to console herself by jumping rope in the back yard and playing tag with Maud in the drying room, where she likewise gave lessons in Nes Gymnics, as Maud called it, which did that little person good fanny came up sometimes to teach them a new dancing step and more than once was betrayed into a game of romps for which she was none the worse but tom turned a cold shoulder to polly and made it evident by his cavalier manner that he really didn't think her worth a sixpence another thing that troubled polly was her clothes for though no one said anything she knew they were very plain and now and then she wished that her blue and mouse-coloured merinos were rather more trimmed her sashes had bigger bows and her little ruffles more lace on them she sighed for a locket and for the first time in her life thought seriously of turning up her pretty curls and putting on a wad she kept these discontents to herself however after she had written to ask her mother if she might have her best dress altered like fanny's and received this reply no dear the dress is proper and becoming as it is and the old fashion of simplicity the best for all of us i don't want my polly to be loved for her clothes but for herself so wear the plain frocks mother took such pleasure in making for you and let the panniers go the least of us have some influence in this big world then perhaps my little girl can do some good by showing others that a contented heart and a happy face are better ornaments than any paris can give her you want a locket dearie so i send one that my mother gave me years ago you will find father's face on one side, mine on the other, and when things trouble you, just look at your talisman, and I think the sunshine will come back again. Of course it did, for the best of all magic was shut up in the quaint little case that Polly wore inside her frock and kissed so tenderly each night and morning. The thought that, insignificant as she was she yet might do some good made her very careful of her acts and words and so anxious to keep head contented and face happy that she forgot her clothes and made others do the same she did not know it but that good old fashion of simplicity made the plain gowns pretty and the grace of unconsciousness beautified their little wearer with the charm that makes girlhood sweetest to those who truly love and reverence it one temptation polly had already yielded to before the letter came and repented heartily of afterward polly i wish you'd let me call you marie said fanny one day as they were shopping together you may call me mary if you like but i won't have any i e put on to my name i'm polly at home and i'm fond of being called so but marie is frenchified and silly i spell my own name with an i e and so do all the girls and what a jumble of nettie's nellie's hatties and sally's there is how polly would look spelt so well never mind that wasn't what i began to say there's one thing you must have and that is bronze boots said fan impressively why must i when i've got enough without because it's the fashion to have them and you can't be finished off properly without i'm going to get a pair and so must you don't they cost a great deal eight or nine dollars i believe i have mine charged but it don't matter if you haven't got the money i can lend you some i've got ten dollars to do what i like with but it's meant to get some presents for the children and polly took out her purse in an undecided way you can make presents easy enough grandma knows all sorts of nice contrivances they'll do just as well and then you can get your boots well i'll look at them said polly 
following fanny into the store feeling rather rich and important to be shopping in this elegant manner aren't they lovely your foot is perfectly divine in that boot polly get them for my party you'll dance like a fairy whispered fan polly surveyed the dainty shining boot with the scalloped top the jaunty heel and the delicate toe thought her foot did look very well in it and after a little pause said she would have them it was all very delightful till she got home and was alone then on looking into her purse she saw one dollar and the list of things she meant to get for mother and the children how mean the dollar looked all alone and how long the list grew when there was nothing to buy the articles i can't make skates for ned nor a desk for will and those are what they have set their hearts upon father's book and mother's collar are impossible now and i'm a selfish thing to go and spend all my money for myself how could i do it and polly eyed the new boots reproachfully as they stood in the first position as if ready for the party they are lovely but i don't believe they will feel good for i shall be thinking about my lost presents all the time sighed polly pushing the enticing boots out of sight i'll go and ask grandma what i can do for if i've got to make something for every one i must begin right away or i shan't get done and off she bustled glad to forget her remorse in hard work grandma proved equal to the emergency and planned something for every one supplying materials taste and skill in the most delightful manner polly felt much comforted but while she began to knit a pretty pair of white bed socks to be tied with rose-colored ribbons for her mother she thought some very sober thoughts upon the subject of temptation and if any one had asked her just then what made her sigh as if something lay heavy on her conscience she would have answered bronze boots End of chapter three